Business and Literature at Western Illinois University in the United States. Yeah. So prior to that, he had been Professor of Humanity and Director of the Center for the Study of Languages at Rice University, Houston, USA, and Professor and Head of the School of Languages and International Education at the University of Canberra in Australia. He has had further professional appointment and been head of department in two other universities in Australia, Chem Cooks University and Bond University. So now please welcome Professor Andrew Lian with an address on two language learning frameworks you probably didn't know existed. Yes, please welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Fan Te Hong, Chair of ICTE3, Associate Professor Dr. Thambu Piho, and distinguished guests. I uh, am going to give a, a, a little keynote in a minute, but uh, in the meantime, I also wanted to thank uh, Dr. Fan Te Hong at Van Dang University for staging ICTE3. I very much appreciate Dr. Fan Te Hong's very kind remarks, both about me personally and about the future with Asia Call and, and, and independently of Asia Call as well. So thank you very much. Welcome everybody to this wonderful conference. I think that we will have a great time together and uh, I hope that you will enjoy the few words that I have to say. So let me begin by sharing my screen. Can I share my screen? Oh, come on, let's have a smaller image. PowerPoint. Of course, you've got to have a PowerPoint presentation, don't you? Can everybody see the PowerPoint presentation? Hello. Yes, not yes, please. Can you share it again, please? Oh. Yeah. Share again. Okay. Share. Optimize. Share. No. Yeah, right now we can uh, see it. Thank you. So let's start it. Okay. Yeah, it's perfect, right? Perfect? Well, perfect. That's good. Um, let me see. Except for this black line at the top, which I don't like. But there's nothing I can do about it. Okay. So, thank you. For, uh, for the conference to everybody, as I said. I have the honor of being president of ICTE, and this is not a usual... Something's happening. I've got two screens. Why have I got two screens? All right. Let me move this down if I can. This is interesting. This has never happened to me before. You're not doing it. Are you, are you, let me stop the share for a moment. I'm sorry. I had to do this. Okay. So I'm in focus mode. Share it. I'll just share the PowerPoint. And for some reason, I still have this. Okay, thank you. Somebody did something. All right, so let me begin. At the closing session of the last ICTE conference, I pointed out that I thought much of the research being done was basically kind of low level. And that, so again, there was not enough high level research. What I mean by high level is not that the research that we're doing now is not good, that, or that, or that it's, uh, it's not valuable, but rather that it tends to focus on small 
uh, things such as you know are people are people using prepositions correctly are people using verbs correctly and so on uh, and there was not enough being done with high level frameworks and that was the the criticism i suppose that i had and still have of the field and this is also partly because the pressure on us to publish is so high that we have to uh, to 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 do the best we have uh, uh, the best we can with what we have and produce 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 sometimes there comes a time when you have to stop and you've got to think about things and that's when high level structures come through so we're worrying about little uh, little things and I thought I would try to illustrate but before we do that, why choose this title, right? Strange title. Well, first of all, finding interesting titles for keynote addresses is, is a bit of a challenge because, you know, people come and talk to you about their research or, or try to explain to you that computers are good or computers are bad or that this approach is better than others and so on. So finding interesting titles is a bit of a challenge. Now, as it happens, I do a lot of work with computers and watch a lot of videos on YouTube relating to those, uh, to computers. And I come across titles like 10 amazing websites you didn't know existed or 10 secret websites you've never heard of before. So I thought I'd give it a go with some frameworks that most of my doctoral students have never heard of. And I'll just do two today. Uh, but in fact, I don't really mean that no one at this conference will know the existence of these frameworks. Especially if you're teaching in universities, you will know them. So I, I'm guessing, though, that more people will not know them than will actually know them, hence the title. I, I guess we will find out. If you switch your microphones on, do you, does anybody want to have a guess? My students are not allowed to have guesses. I noticed that a couple of students or ex-students are online. Apart from that, could you, does anybody want to have a guess? And by the way, all three, all three, let me move this back up, all three frameworks um, I work with and, and my students do too. Now, you sure you don't want to have a guess as to what the first framework is? All right. You're all very quiet. The first framework is urbotonalism. Urbotonalism, urbotonal theory or urbotonalism was created by a professor called Peter Guberina from the University of Zagreb in what was then called Yugoslavia, it's now called Croatia. And it, the theory has tended to be dormant for many years, but it has revived in recent research that we've been doing at SUT and elsewhere. By the way, I'm also, just to make clear, I also have an appointment at the Open University at Ho Chi Minh City, where I uh, take part in the doctoral program. Now, what is verbotonism? It's a theory of perception. It's a theory of perception with special application to both the hard of hearing, in other words, people who cannot hear properly, and language learners, and has been widely used for, um, okay, my should turn off, and has been widely used although it's been used invisibly Right? In almost, uh, because, because most documents are actually in French or Silver Christ, not much in English. However, its principles have been applied beyond perception to language learning and it's been done rather badly for the most part. I'm not going to, I don't have time to talk about it now. And while the theory is heavily used for pronunciation work, it can be thought of as a theory of comprehension as it treats sound recognition as an act of comprehension. You don't just hear sounds, you actually make sense of the incoming physical signals 
which uh, come into your ears. And the brain is very smart. It distinguishes between language and non-language sounds. Characteristics of verbal tonal theory include a focus on awareness raising. I want to emphasize the notion of awareness raising. It's a very important uh, issue in language learning or learning of any kind. And the awareness raising circumvents the blockages from our past. Okay? Now, an understanding that phonemes and other language sounds can be recognized, this is the second important point, Phonemes and other language sounds, including intonation, can be recognized on the basis of limited frequency bands. These bands are called optimals. And each language sound has a distinctive set of optimals. It is the frequency at which a native speaker or a non-native speaker can best hear the sound and can best reproduce it, which means that there is a close connection between perception and production. There are native speaker optimals and there are corrective optimals. Corrective optimals are sound frequencies which are used for um, helping foreign language learners to pronounce correctly. When I say correctly, I don't mean to sound like a native speaker of anything of English or Australian or whatever, but to sound intelligible so that they don't make uh, mistakes that confuse listeners. Now, in order to be able to, pron to pronounce foreign language sounds, the learner needs to perceive the sound correctly. They need to be able to access what's called the critical elements of the sound in question, and that can be tri tricky without some awareness raising help. Sounds are not isolated from their linguistic and communicative context. I want to make this pretty clear. And furthermore, the right brain, the right side of the brain, is of extreme importance in perceiving language sounds. What's important? Why is that? Well, the right brain preferentially processes melodic information. Melodic information means intonation, means musical information. That is part of every language. Now, we can use this ability to enable learners to process the foreign language more successfully through the exploitation of melodic information. And then we connect the left brain and the right brain to one another. I also want to make the point that intonation is not separate from phonemes. Typically, people teach you the vowels and the consonants of sound, but actually, it's an integral part of all voiced sounds. Now, verbotonalism also sees language as a whole body experience. Whole body. The entire body is part of the language process. And there is synchronization between the body and the language. So that you can actually dance to the melody of a language and as it's presented to the learners. And one of the ways in which it's presented to learners is in the form of low-pass filtered samples. And I'm going to play you some in a moment, so somebody please switch on your microphones to, and be prepared to tell me if you can hear the sounds that I will send you. Now, filtering of the sounds of language is one of the more intriguing aspects of awareness raising with verbotonus. Filtering can be applied to both prosody and individual sounds. What is it? Well, it's a process by which an audio signal has certain frequency ranges removed, thus altering the quality of the sounds sent to the listener. So here's an example. This is a spectrum of a sentence on the top. On the top, you see green, and that's a, 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 an amplitude representation of the sound. But at the bottom, with a circle around it, <clears throat> You see some unfiltered sounds, and you see that there are lots and lots of orange and red lines. That's the unfiltered part. The filtered part is surrounded by this next circle that's appeared on the screen, and you can see that a lot of the orange lines have disappeared, and it's left the lines at the bottom. 
The lines at the bottom are very low frequency. They sound like, mm, like this. In fact, you will hear them in a minute. So low pass filtering highlights the melody of the language, including the rhythm, stress, and loudness. And you can use this to teach intonation. But it's not just intonation that you learn from these things, as we discovered in our research. We also have, uh, we also have some um, connection with, uh, with grammar and fluency. And that's a very important thing. So I'm going to play you something. You will not understand it, but you will hear something. Please tell me if you hear this. Can you hear it? Can you hear that? Anybody? Yes. Thank you. You're not supposed to hear the music, you're not supposed to hear any words. What is it? Anyone want to try and tell me? Hello, John. When did you get that? That's the unfiltered version. So the filtered version is this. The unfiltered version is this. Hello, John. When did you get back? What does the left one do? What is it all about? Anyone want to try? Say something. All right, the left one, we don't have time. So the left one is actually the intonation of the sentence on the right. Sounds the same. Listen to the music. Listen to the music. Hello, John. When did you get back? Because it's the same sentence, actually. Three recent studies at SUT. We've done one was to enhance the intonation of Chinese university students. One was to enhance the speaking skills of eight and nine year old Chinese students. And the third one was to enable Chinese university learners of English to produce and contrast acceptably, acceptably, not like a native speaker, but acceptably, a selection of vowel sounds. And, and uh, we will get back to this in a minute. All three studies focused on intelligibility rather than native speaker compliance. The first two studies I'm not going to spend much time. I'm not going to spend much time on, on any of them, but just to say that when people develop correct intonation and melody, they also improve their pronunciation. It happens by magic. Well, not quite by magic. There is an explanation, but there's no time for it today. Low pass filtering because it is melodic impacts on the right hemisphere of the brain, which is good at processing melody. Thus, for prosody training, listening to filtered language will have a much greater impact than listening to an actual language. Now, on the one of the basic principles of verbal tonal theory is that in the case of pronunciation, if you provide the learner's brain with the right kind of physical signal, then the brain will do the rest and perceive and produce better because the work is done unconsciously by the brain. And because it's done unconsciously, there's no need to worry about diagrams, how to hold your mouth, how to hold your lips, and so on. All three of the experiments required just listen and repeat activities. There was no recording voices, no comparing with native speaker models, although you can do that if you like. And there was no actual teaching by anybody. What, what was there is that there was, there was somebody who, who gave students an opportunity to, well, to organize them first and give them an opportunity to dance to the music of the language and predict what the sounds were all about. Uh, all the experiments were highly successful. And on top of that, the children's phonological working memory grew, which is very important. It gives you it means that the children's ability to process language and sound, at least, was much more efficient. One of the things I wanted to point out is that we use double-blind ratings. Double-blind ratings is when the raters of something do not know whether they are listening to 
pretest post test or control and experimental groups. Very important part of testing. Sometimes results were surprising and unexpected, for example, greater fluency, because fluency is not just a question of having a good pronunciation, it's also a question of retrieving uh, linguistic information, encoding it, putting it into a stream, and then outputting it. That's really important. And there was no teacher. Now, when I say there was no teacher, don't go and, and say, oh, you don't want teachers, you don't like teachers, that's not what I mean. What I mean is that we, we can, can find ways of relieving teachers from doing a lot of work and have some things which happen automatically. And once the right signals were sent to the brain, it all worked itself out. We did another experiment just recently, and I spoke about it a little last year, using what's called dichotic listening. Dichotic listening is a process by which you listen, you, have, you feed once one audio signal to the left ear and a different audio signal to the right ear. In our case, we did some studies, uh, again in China, where we fed some filtered signals, like filtered like the ones you heard, and then the, the unfiltered sentence in the right ear or in the left ear, and we switched them around. We discovered that Chinese learners of English process English best with left ear filtered and right ear unfiltered. And, and that, that was, was better than natural language. language. They, they processed, processed it better than that natural, natural language. And, and they, they processed it worse with the opposite configuration, configuration left ear unfiltered, right ear filtered. The load is heaviest on the brain. brain. So, so this concerned the hypothesis that sending each brain hemisphere the signals that it best processed facilitates overall processing. processing. And, and this was better than listening to unfiltered language in both ears. I want, I want to make that point. point. Now, now, a low processing mode means, means more mental resources are available for other tasks. tasks. And we used this kind of study to track the load on the brain. This one was with an electroencephalogram. And we used functional magnetic resonance imagery to track the blood flow, blood flow of people who are processing the signals. Now, when, when, you, when you provide learners, when you provide learners with filtered, dichotic filtered language of this kind, it looks as though you are enabling them to become more effective at language processing. And this is something that seems to be true uh, in another experiment, which is as yet unreported, being carried out at the moment again in China. Just, just listening, listening instead of listening to natural language, language just listening to filtered language for listening comprehension and so on, uh, gives you an improvement in the results. Not bad for doing nothing. So last year I mentioned in this in this uh, conference that we have currently we have forms, focus on form and focus on forms. FONFS, and now we have focused on the physical, something that we don't normally do. The second framework I want to talk about is called precision language education. Precision language education. It's a term that uh, I invented at uh, Tom Dukkan University in 2016, and we published something about it in 2017. It was broadly inspired by precision medicine. And, and precision, precision medicine, medicine is something which is now happening in the United States, States particularly. And what, what it means is that you tailor, you tailor the treatment of the patient with a very precise analysis of their needs. So on the left, you have a treatment where you give the same treatment to everybody, same therapy. Some, some people benefit, benefit, some people have no benefit, and some people have adverse effects. With a proper, uh, properly uh, set up precision medicine, some people will, all people will benefit because you do DNA tests and you tailor the therapy to every person. Now, the idea is to do the same with language education. 
so you need to effect a very precise diagnosis of each learner. You cannot have a class of people because each learner has different needs and reacts differently to the signals around them. Right. So, you need to have a one-to-one -one personalized learning intervention and you need to have a framework that allows you to have that intervention. Traditional classrooms do not let you do that very easily unless you do this diagnostic work outside of the classroom. Okay, so what does this mean? It implies conducting increasingly accurate and interdisciplinary research to develop systems capable of responding to learners' individual needs. You can even optimize group experiences, if you like, if you can bring people with similar needs, very similar needs together. Now, some of these precision-based systems will be technological in nature and will depend on technological support. And they will be of special relevance to us in the ASEAN mass market with the number of learners in need of personalized high-level language skills often at short notice will rise sharply. Let me give you an example from the study mentioned uh, in the verbal tonal section of this talk. Dr. Wang Feng Wei performed a study relating to the pronunciation of six English vowels in three contrasting pairs. He established the corrective optimals, which we talked about, of the six vowels. And then, for example, imagine that a Mandarin-speaking Chinese English language learners having difficulty distinguishing between ship and sheep. Remember this one? Ship and sheep at the production level. And this is hindering intelligibility. So what do we do? Well, it's quite simple. We diagnose the student and we send the student away to listen to filtered into, uh, sounds and contrasts and repeat them. Now, this is what we discovered. For the sound E, as in sheep, 89.2% of the learners favored this particular set of frequencies, and I'm not going to explain them. 10.8% of learners favored something else. So even at that level, at the statistical level, you have uh, you have some differences. Now, here's what SHIP filtered sounds like at the optimal. SHIP. 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 Students listen to that and produce the correct sound. Here's a non-optimal version of SHIP. SHIP. By the way, just in case you think there's a trick there, there isn't. This is actually exactly the same sentence, this is exactly the same word, which has been filtered differently. So you can take the word ship, which was recorded correctly, which happened to be my voice, recorded correctly, and then you filter it, and you can make, make it sound like sheep. Listen. Hmm, interesting. Okay. So for the sound E as in sheep, the frequencies are distributed differently, and I won't go through them, and I won't demonstrate them, but just that you know that this phenomenon happens in real life. At the end of the diagnostic session, the student is provided with two sets of optimals, goes away, listens, and repeats, and guess what? The size of learner's improvement, look at the last line there, the size of learner's improvement in the experimental group was up to 600% the size of learner's improvement in the control group, just by listening to something different. Not the natural words, but filtered words. And remember, both groups did exactly the same exercise. Okay, okay, this is only one, one example of precision at work. There's other examples. examples. You can do things with listening comprehension. For example, this is something I put together a very long time ago, <clears throat> where students write something with, with, that they think they heard when listening to something, and the machine gives them some feedback and says, no, this word is wrong, or you should think differently. 
And here's another, another way, way of creating a precision language learning environment where students can create their own lessons, not somebody else's lessons, not the lesson on page 27 of the textbook, but their own lessons. Now, we use in conjunction with rhizomatic learning, <laughs> the third one, it's the third framework, but I'm not going to talk about it today. We use in conjunction with rhizomatic learning, the rhizome reveals problems in more detail and more accurately than traditional systems. It, it then passes, passes them on to precision, precision language education for remediation. Both, Both are part of the same precision mindset, but, but there's no, no time, time to examine rhizomatic systems. systems. We, we can, can talk about them at some other time. You can read, read about them in my publications. publications. Uh, and, and I should say this, this would have been a third and, and very important and also unknown framework, framework for language learning, learning. and not just for language learning. So looking, so looking at cycling to the future, it is possible to envisage a scenario where the diagnostic phase can be entirely computerized. And at Banlang University, we have great experts in AI, and they could, we could work together to do some of this. This would remove human intervention completely from the equation. Now again, this is not against teachers. This is about, about giving students more freedom and, and more opportunities for tailoring, tailoring their study to their needs. Precision language education is a simple concept, concept although it requires a special mindset. mindset. But, the but the difficulty with precision language education lies in the fact that we need to conduct a lot of research in many fields, education, psychology, neuroscience, linguistics, and this may take some time to grow. It may also require us to venture into fields that we are unaccustomed with such as neuroscience and computing. But that, I think, is the future of the field. The future of the field is no longer in words and grammar. It is now, and it's no longer in trying to make people interested in, in things. It's, it's about tapping into their processing systems. How do we make sense of the world? We have to change our minds. How do we make sense of the world? How do we perceive sounds, colors, language? We've got to think about all of those things when teaching a language. And, and in particular, these mindsets that I've been talking about take us away from the idea of a one-size-fits-all approach to language education, with a single lesson plan, the one that you have been asked to produce in preparation for your class. And this is especially the case if you take them in conjunction with rhizomatic learning. No time to talk about it. Anyway, this, this brings, brings us to the end of our little journey. journey. Individually and collective, these systems, all three of them, can, can contribute to major changes in the way that we do things in our profession. There are different mindsets, different ways of doing things, different ways of identifying needs. If you hadn't heard about these two or three approaches, well, I hope that you enjoy discovering them. Okay? Uh, and if you had, then, then I, I hope that, that there was something in, of interest in, in, in my descriptions. And we'll stop there. Thank, Thank you very much. much. I will unshare my screen. screen.